every time anyone pays for anything, there's going to be an extra cost involved. There isn't a single currency other than Bitcoin that has done anything that Bitcoin can do. There is no way that you will ever have the speed of final settlement with Bitcoin or the low expense of accomplishing it than you can have today with all kinds of other monies. Compared to the real alternatives that exist today, Bitcoin is the only one, the only one that offers us the chance of having a monetary system free of government control. About a third of all Bitcoin exchanges have been hacked at one time or another. That's in comparison to about 1% of banks. All of the people that are just constantly finding problems with Bitcoin need to just come to peace with it. This is your only alternative to central banks. Deal with it. <laughs> we now have to segue into the main event, uh, which is uh, the debate on the resolution, Bitcoin is poorly suited to the purpose of becoming any nation's main medium of exchange. Arguing for the affirmative, George Selgin. George, please come to the stage. <laughs> Arguing for the negative, Safedian, Safedian Amus. Safe, please come to the stage. Fifteen minutes to establish the affirmative for the resolution. Jane, please close the voting. Thank you, Gene. Thank you all for giving me this opportunity to try to convince you that Bitcoin isn't quite as great as you think. <clears throat> uh, I want to start out by saying uh, that uh, this is important. I'm not against Bitcoin. I'm, I'm pointing this out because I think it was late last week, somebody on Twitter said, oh, I didn't know Selgin was against Bitcoin. I, I tweeted back, I said, I'm not against Bitcoin. Uh, I'm actually quite keen on Bitcoin in many respects. I think it's a wonderful development and it's ushering in a, a whole set of technological possibilities that, uh, that I regard as extremely important and intriguing. And, I, and in fact, years ago, before many economists were writing about this stuff, I wrote an article about why I thought uh, cryptocurrencies generally, not Bitcoin specifically, offered some possibilities for monetary reform that, uh, that were unprecedented and uh, potentially uh, the best, some of the best possibilities we've seen yet. And I'm not an apologist for official monies. I want you to know that too, because I'm about to claim that it's very unlikely uh, think practically impossible that Bitcoin will take over uh, from any uh, established official money. But that's not because I like official monies. I've written most of my career against government mon monopolies of money, and I favor privatization. I'd like to see money privatized. It's just that I don't think Bitcoin is cut out for the job. And that's the argument I have to make today. I want to start by pointing out that it's an uphill battle for any new upstart money to replace, to set aside uh, an incumbent money, to, to, to win people over from that incumbent money. And that's because money is a, a, a network good. It's perhaps the most clear-cut case of a network good out there. What's a network good? It's a good where the usefulness of the good to anybody is a function of how many other people are using it. And money is a, is a classic network good in that sense. The, the first question a person asks about whether to use a money or not, whether it's a good money, is whether they can, is what can I buy with this stuff? How many people will take it in exchange for things they have to sell? That's the first thing that people want to know about any money. And of course, if you have an established incumbent money someplace, then that's the stuff everybody is willing to trade for. And it is disadvantageous, to put it mildly, to try to use something else. Anyone who's ever traveled knows that if you go to another country 
and you whip out your dollars, you find, suddenly discover that in most cases, not in all, because the dollar is one of the more widely used monies, that uh, your dollars aren't particularly valuable in other parts of the world. And it's certainly true for Bitcoin, that Bitcoin is not widely used anywhere in the world, though it is used to some extent. So I come to the proposition that's going to inform the rest of my remarks this evening. And that is simply this, that a necessary condition for an upstart money to succeed in replacing an established incumbent money is that it has to be considerably more attractive than that incumbent. It has to be so attractive that it's able to overcome the fact that the incumbent money is already widely accepted, has a big network compared to the upstart. So you have to have a lot of attractive features. And in that case, the more attractive money can gain, not only gain a footnote, foothold, but can acquire over time uh, 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 a, a successful a network, a network that grows so big that it can displace the established money. So what I want to do in the remainder of my time is to talk about the features of Bitcoin and ask just how attractive is Bitcoin? Is it attractive in enough ways to give it a chance to take over from an established money if that money also is relatively unattractive in some ways? So let's talk about it. I want to start with the question of trust. Trust, I think, is one of the things that makes Bitcoin attractive. What I mean by trust here is one particular thing. We can ha hash it out in other ways. But the sense in which Bitcoin is attractive with respect to trust is that there's no central authority that can suddenly create oodles of the stuff. You all know, I'm sure, that there will be a maximum of approximately 21 million bitcoins issued uh, ever. That they, we have a supply that grows according to a more or less preset schedule and that will asymptotically reach that amount, and that's that. This means that you don't have to worry about somebody pushing a bitcoin button somewhere where it's going to be 40 million or 100 million or some large amount. Whereas with government money issuers, there is some risk, no doubt that they could abuse their powers of money creation, and of course, in some famous cases, they either have done it or are doing it, and make their monies worthless as a result. Uh, so this is a respect in which Bitcoin, I think, deserves a very high grade. Let's give it an A. Uh, it must be said, however, that that many currencies in the world are not hyperinflating, and that indeed, if there is a problem with currencies around the world today, in many cases, it's that at least as far as their issuing authorities are concerned, they're not losing value quite quickly enough. Now, I'll come back to the basket cases toward the end of my remarks and talk about why even in those, risk, in those cases, I don't think Bitcoin is likely to take over, but I'm going to save that for later. So on the question of trust, Bitcoin earns a high grade. It earns a high grade on privacy. It's not quite uh, anonymous, as you know. It's pseudonymous. It gives people the ability to transact with uh, an identity that is their own uh, secret, as it were, and they can accomplish transactions uh, uh, with this pseudonym instead of having records that actually name them and allow people to find out what they've been up to. This privacy aspect of Bitcoin deserves an A- minus for the simple reason that it isn't all that hard, I'm told, for people to find out through tracing different transactions to sometimes place names on, uh, to name the people who are transacting in Bitcoin to discover who they are as a result of a little bit of detective work. But still, it's not bad. But now we come to some other features of Bitcoin that I think make it highly unattractive, at least to the average person. One of these is vulnerability to hacking. Here I'd give Bitcoin a C- or a D. 
I think it's uh, correct to say that about a third of all Bitcoin exchanges have been hacked at one time or another. That's in comparison to about 1% of banks having been hacked. I think that's for this country. I don't know the worldwide figures. Uh, the truth is a lot of money, something approaching $2 billion worth, uh, $2 billion has been uh, stolen in, in Bitcoin. Uh, that's quite a large percentage of the total. Um, so safety from hacking, theft, if you like, not a very good score. Next, let's take up value volatility. Things are getting worse. Uh, people, when they deal with a medium of exchange, don't want it to be risky for a very good reason. A lot of us like to take risks, but we like to do it on purpose. We don't like the stuff that we passively receive in payments to be risky. That means we have to go out of our way to avoid risk by investing it in something else. And any amount that we keep on hand for exchange purposes is subject to big changes in value. I know that I don't want the value of my money holdings to change dramatically uh, while I decide where to go shopping or what investments to make. On value volatility, Bitcoin definitely earns an F. Most monetary economists will tell you that for the same reason, gold is a very poor medium of exchange. Its value is highly volatile. It bounces around a great deal. Yet, if you look at the standard deviation of value changes in Bitcoin, they're about seven times as great. The standard deviation is about seven times as great that of gold. So this is a highly volatile medium of exchange or potential medium of exchange, and that makes it quite unattractive. Now I'm going to come to the last point, which is the cost of transacting, or if you like, the speed of transacting. There, these are related. And here, Bitcoin rates definitely a D to an F, something like that. It's, it's notoriously non-scalable. That means that in practice, small transactions can be very, very expensive. For very large transactions, it's not such a big problem. There was something called a transactions uh, crisis, transactions fee crisis back in late 2017, during which it could cost anywhere from 20 to 45 bucks just to transfer any amount of Bitcoin, any amount. That's a fixed fee. Today, it's much better, but it's widely recognized in the Bitcoin community that the transactions fees are not competitive with other established monies. Just today, I've been writing, lately, I've been writing about dollar transfers. And now it's possible to have instantaneous dollar transfers for basically for nothing, a few pennies, if that, on all kinds of networks. And that's only going to increase. Whereas with Bitcoin, if you want an instant transaction, it's going to cost you. And that means every time anyone pays for anything, there's going to be an extra cost involved. Now, it's true that there are attempts to reduce this cost, particularly the Lightning Network is, is mentioned as one attempt to overcome the uh, transaction costs of Bitcoin. But uh, it's still not clear that that will succeed. And it involves, at very least, a second layer of transactions where the whole element of trust that is one of the key attractive features of Bitcoin, now you have, you have to rely on a centralized party to handle these transactions which are done off the chain, so to speak. And even so, it doesn't work so well when you have non-repeat transactions. So, uh, now, these are all reasons why Bitcoin is unlikely to be as popular with the average person as it is with many people in this room. And this is the average person's willingness to use Bitcoin as an everyday medium of exchange that matters for its being able to take over an incumbent currency anywhere. Now, having said that, I have to say that it's true that in some countries, not here, not now, but in some countries, the incumbent currencies are terrible. They're hyperinflating. They're losing value very quickly. They impose costs on their peop the people who use them 
that are such as could make a currency like Bitcoin seem relatively attractive. In that case, we could say, in those cases, that Bitcoin does meet the necessary conditions, that the necessary conditions for it to take over are met, but those conditions aren't sufficient. And here we come to the other part of the equation. Because even though Bitcoin might be more attractive than some incumbent currencies, before people turn to Bitcoin, they have many other options they could consider that could still be more attractive than Bitcoin. They could turn to the dollar. They could turn to the euro. They could turn to any number of alternative means of payment that would make Bitcoin uh, belong far down the list of prospective rivals. So it's not just the case that Bitcoin has to be more attractive than an established currency. It has to be more attractive than any number of alternative currencies that could be adopted instead of Bitcoin, and that also have, like the US dollar, very large established networks around the world. So for all of these reasons, I think the likelihood of Bitcoin ever becoming any nation's main medium of exchange is vanishingly small. I want to end with one final point. Among these other currencies that could be more attractive than Bitcoin and might have a better chance of becoming a nation's money than it does, I would name other prospective cryptocurrencies. I, I think it's still a very early stage in the world of cryptocurrency, in the, in the story of cryptocurrency development. And some of these other cryptocurrencies avoid the flaws of Bitcoin that make it a poor candidate. Thank you very much. OK, thank you very much, first of all, to the Soho Forum for the invitation and for the opportunity to speak here today. Um, thank you very much for Professor Selgin for his comments. I'm going to get to the meat of it, I guess, uh, straight away. The, I think the key thing to keep in mind is that Bitcoin is already working. Bitcoin is functional. It's been operating nonstop for practically 10 years. And it is already, um, I, don't, I don't remember the exact number right now, but it is already one of the top 20 largest valued currencies in the world. So it's already bigger than many currencies of many other nation states. And most importantly, in its functional role right now, Bitcoin is the only working alternative to central banks. In other words, if you'd like to send money from here to China, your only option up until the year 2008 was to go through the central bank. Now, after Bitcoin was invented, you're able to do it with the press of a button in an automatic way that doesn't rely on anybody else, in the same way that when you call somebody, you know, you just press a bunch of buttons, but there's nobody needed to let the call go through. It's become a mechanical electronic process that takes, um, you know, that happens because machines do it, and it's not because people um, intermediate it. So Bitcoin is already allowing for transfers across international borders and is already breaking central banks' monopoly over that. So I think the notion that Bitcoin um, has been failing, I think is completely unrealistic. Or the notion that Bitcoin's likelihood of succeeding has been declining and is vanishingly small, I think is contrary to reality, because in reality, we see that Bitcoin has been growing nonstop over the last 10 years. And if you've looked at the growth rate and you think that, oh, Bitcoin hasn't grown fast enough over the last 10 years, clearly you haven't looked at the growth rate. It's, it couldn't possibly have grown any fa I mean, could, but it's been an enormously fast growth rate. And the notion that we could get a monetary system, and this is really, I think, the main problem with Professor Selgin's comments, the idea that Bitcoin has to basically be born ready to handle everybody's transactions overnight and to have all of the world's liquidity handed to it overnight from its creation or else it has failed, I think that is a completely unrealistic way of assessing it. Bitcoin has been growing in every metric that matters, and Bitcoin has been improving in every metric that matters. And there are simply no objectionable reasons why you would say that Bitcoin cannot work as a monetary system. And um, 
so to get to the point that uh, Professor Selgin mentions that Bitcoin, you know, displacing a money is something that is very hard. I think it's not as hard as we, uh, as he makes it out to be. Hundreds of fiat currencies over the 20th century have been destroyed many several times over each other. Uh, you know, many currencies were destroyed several times, and they were replaced by new currencies or currencies of other countries. Silver was demonetized, seashells, um, all kinds of other uh, kinds of money have lost their monetary role. And you know, the people who used to use seashells, their network effect didn't protect them because when people came into their island with gold, the harder money won. And this is the dynamic that Professor Selgin ignores. Bitcoin isn't a startup that needs to do marketing to attract people. Bitcoin isn't going to win because it's going to, you know, have a better user experience or a, um, you know, nicer user interface than uh, your Apple Pay uh, or whatever. Bitcoin's value proposition is that it is hard money. And hard money beats out easy money and soft money because soft money and easy money is easy to overproduce. And so anytime we look at history, and this is what I discuss extensively in my book, you know, when people were using seashells, Europeans arrive, they can make seashells, they can dig out for seashells easily, they flood the supply of seashells, seashells lose their monetary role, people use gold. And the same has happened with many other media. And this is essentially the process that has been going on for the last 10 years with Bitcoin. It's a harder form of money, and it's gaining value because people would rather hold the harder money than the easier money. And also it's gaining value because all of the easier monies are being inflated at a much faster rate. And so that really is Bitcoin's competition. The problem, um, we can always nitpick with Bitcoin and find things that we think are wrong with Bitcoin, but that is the alternative. That is, that is the only working alternative that can um, compete with government monies. And the problem with the other currencies that Professor Selgin mentions and the problem with any other attempt to try and um, compete or to try and introduce a new monetary standard, the problem that as libertarians, I think we, people who probably are a lot of libertarians in the crowd, you know, the problem is simply government won't allow a free market monetary system to function because they want to take it over. That's what happened with the gold system. Bitcoin's most important, um, uh, most important characteristic probably, other than its hardness, is the fact that it resists government capture and control. Because of the evolution of Bitcoin, and this is something that doesn't share with any of the other digital coins, which are all centralized because they were all born after Bitcoin, and because you know they'd never had the they never had the process of a neutral protocol growing on the internet on its own without a person being in charge, because the person who created it disappeared. All the other coins have someone in charge. All the other coins are trivial to compromise and trivial to capture, and therefore they are not realistic. And any ideas of uh, they are not realistic competitors to government money. They can be easily shut down. So the reason Bitcoin really can succeed is ultimately because of its hardness and because of its um, resistance to government capture. And I think those two things trump all the other considerations that Professor Selgin had mentioned. And um, to go to his points, I'll say, um, on the issue of privacy, I think you are giving Bitcoin a little too much credit. Uh, it's, it's not as good as you think it is, but I don't think that even matters. I think Bitcoin would function perfectly fine even if every single coin's owner was well known. People would still own Bitcoin if it meant that you had to, you had to have your ownership known. I think people would still use it because I think it's the hardness that is the value proposition. It's not the privacy. Um, in terms of vulnerability to hacking, I think, of course, the, 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 this is kind of unfair because Bitcoin is very new and the people who use the technology are still learning how to use it, so it's natural that people will have all of these growing pains. And of course, you know, the infrastructure for handling Bitcoin better at an individual level and at an institutional level is still in an infant stage, and so also it's not fair to dismiss Bitcoin um, out of hand because you know, it's still at the point where we're developing those technologies. In terms of vol value volatility, again, this is an issue of maturity. Bitcoin has only been around for 10 years, and yet it went from just a bunch of code written on an email list to being worth around, what, $200 billion in total right now, which is no joke. Now, $200 billion is no joke, but it's kind of a joke on a global scale of the total globe's money supply. It's about 0.2 to 0.3% of the world's entire money supply. There are people out there who own billions of dollars, and if one of them decides to buy a billion dollars worth of Bitcoin, they're going to eat up the order book in all the Bitcoin exchanges, and that's going to cause the price to be very volatile. Because the liquidity is so small, because this thing is embryonic, 
the size of the order book, the depth of the order book, the size of the liquidity that's available is obviously not very large. And the size of the people, that, the size of the money that wants to go into it is much larger. And so these movements in and out are likely to have a big effect on the price. But over time, as you would expect Bitcoin to mature further, as you would expect that the liquidity would grow, you know, if it's gone in 10 years from zero to 200 billion, well, let's hypothesize that in another 10 years, it goes from 200 billion to 2 trillion, which is not that far of a stretch, it's only 10 times. But if it was a $2 trillion market, then it's going to be far less volatile because then you're going to go have a very deep order book and individual transactions won't be able to move it. And eventually, you know, a monetary, a monetary system, a monetary medium gains stability in its value because of the fact that it, is, it has an enormous number of people selling and buying it at the same time. And so Bitcoin doesn't have that yet, but it is building it, and there's no reason to suppose that it won't be able to build it. We're just witnessing more and more um, liquidity being added onto the system, and I think this is going to continue. Um, on, with respect to point five on the cost of transacting, I think this completely misses the point and unfortunately shows that Professor Selgin did not prepare for this debate by reading my book. And I am very disappointed because I've read a lot of his books. Um, and I, I should say, I've learned a lot from his books and I've learned a lot from his work. Um, but the, the, the point is that people compare the cost of Bitcoin transactions to your credit card transaction or a um, or you know your bank transfer, and I think that misses the point because when you're actually making a payment with a credit card transaction, you're not actually or with any kind of PayPal or Venmo or any of those things. Yes, you're making it instantly, and yes, it's very cheap, but it's really just an entry ledger at PayPal that is says money went from a account A to account B. The actual final settlement of that transaction takes many more weeks. And what Bitcoin transactions are more uh, com comparable to is the final settlement transactions that happen between central banks and financial institutions because those transactions are final. You know, that, and these transactions take much longer time to settle than Bitcoin. Bitcoin can provide you finality of settlement across international borders within a couple of hours. Where, but if you wanted to send money across international borders, central banks take many days and weeks to settle payments between one another. One another. So Bitcoin's payments, the base layer of Bitcoin, the on-chain transactions, cannot really be compared to individual consumer transactions because of uh, the cost, but also, I think more importantly, there is no such thing as an instant tra Bitcoin transaction. You should wait at the very least for two confirmations on any particular Bitcoin transaction, but it's more advisable to wait for six confirmations, which is about an hour. And that makes it completely unusable as a commercial payment technology, but that's fine because commercial payment technology is not a big problem. It's a problem that has been solved by PayPal and Venmo and credit cards and it's the technologies for this are many, and porting them over on top of Bitcoin is largely a trivial problem. We can have Bitcoin-backed credit cards and Bitcoin-backed PayPal, and we can have Bitcoin-backed Venmo. It's pretty straightforward functionally, and there's nothing that prevents it. In other words, if you stop thinking of Bitcoin payments as compared uh, as being like your Venmo or PayPal transactions, you realize that PayPal and Venmo can function on top of Bitcoin. And all of the features that you don't like about Bitcoin, that you like about Venmo, can be essentially ported over to Bitcoin by replacing the settlement transactions of, Bitcoin, of uh, PayPal and Venmo. Instead of them being carried out with dollars and fiat currencies, they can be carried out with um, Bitcoin. And so, you know, um, does this introduce reliance on third parties? Potentially. The Lightning Network is a solution that is going to minimize the reliance on third parties, but th it'll never have the same level of um, uh, uh, trustlessness that the on-chain transaction has. But that's fine, because the competition for second layer trusted Bitcoin transactions is not first layer Bitcoin transactions. The competition is second layer trusted transactions over highly inflating currencies run by governments, highly censorable. And that's really the key point. So don't compare Bitcoin with your credit card because your credit card can be added on top of Bitcoin. But a credit or a PayPal or credit card payment done based on dollars is, uh, is inferior, arguably, to a Bitcoin-based payment because the Bitcoin is the harder money. And that, I think, is really the, the key value proposition. And so, um, 
if you compare Bitcoin to some sort of ideal, we can always nitpick about things that are bad about it. But in reality, the, compared to the real alternatives that exist today, Bitcoin is the only one, the only one that offers us the chance of having a monetary system free of government control, the only one that offers us the chance, and I'm not saying it's going to necessarily happen, but there's, it, it can resist government capture, and there's nothing wrong with its monetary properties that can make it, that would prevent it from becoming a main medium of exchange of a country. The Bitcoin supply being fixed is not, a, is not a disadvantage, it is the main advantage. And I would say to people who are skeptical about it, you know, we should think, you should think about why is it that gold became money? Why isn't it that silver or copper or other metals became money? And that's something I discuss extensively in my book. Gold became money because it is the hardest metal to, uh, whose, uh, whose supply is the hardest to increase. It's hard, the, the new supply of gold every year is tiny compared to the existing stockpile, which makes it ideal as a monetary unit because the vast majority of demand and the va uh, uh, for Bitcoin is monetary, and because the variation in the supply and variations in the production conditions are largely irrelevant to the market. The market is largely monetary. So uh, Mises discusses gold as a monetary good, and he says one of the drawbacks of gold is that it has industrial demand and um, that there is variation in its production because that prevents it from being a purely monetary good. And a purely monetary good would be a good that is bought purely for the purpose of being held as a cash balance, and demand for it is driven by time preference and people's changes in time preference. That's what an ideal monetary good, and Bitcoin in this regard even improves on gold because it doesn't have other industrial uses, and that actually makes it even more suited as a monetary medium for, um, for, for an economy. And I think you know, the, the, the test of the market has shown over the last 10 years, Bitcoin has grown compared to every currency in existence. So the score has been highly favorable for Bitcoin right now. And I don't see why, any reason why things could stop. And I don't see any coherent explanation for why Bitcoin w is fundamentally unsuited. You know, there, there might be problems that happen with Bitcoin. Bitcoin might fail. But I think the idea that it is unsuited is unfounded. And I remain unpersuaded by all the arguments that Professor Salderson presented. Thank you. Um, five minutes of rebuttal. You want to take the podium? Five minutes of rebuttal? Yeah. Yes, well, first of all, uh, I, let me say that as much as I like the idea of privatization of money, even if I were to uh, admit that Bitcoin is the only hope for such privatization, I might still maintain, and I would still maintain, that unfortunately, it can't cut it. And that's, that's, so those are two different issues. So the fact that it's the only possibility, if we grant that, doesn't prove that it's going to, in fact, succeed. Um, one of the things I'd like to rebut is the suggestion that's, uh, that uh, Safe made that uh, the fact that the value of outstanding Bitcoin has gone up so much is a measure of how much progress it's making towards becoming a widely used money. The capitalization of Bitcoin and how extensively it's used as a means of exchange, a means of payment, are quite different things. They're really mo mostly unrelated. Bitcoin can be very, very valuable because of the investment demand being high for it, and yet it may not be used often at all in exchange. And in fact, we know that Bitcoin is not widely accepted in exchange for normal exchanges. It has a fairly good demand, uh, at least uh, relative to other uses for remittances internationally, but even there it faces very stiff competition from more established remittance means like Western Union. But as a medium of exchange domestically, it is really very, very, very small potatoes. Uh, and the value of the outstanding stock of Bitcoin simply doesn't tell you uh, 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 otherwise. Uh, is Bitcoin hard money? In a sense, it is. The absolute amount is limited, and in that sense, it resembles gold or some other precious commodity. It has an advantage over gold in not having a fluctuating non-monetary demand, but there's also a disadvantage there, which is that because there's no non-monetary demand for Bitcoin, there's no basic fundamental demand for it independent of the demand for it either for investment, speculative purposes, or as a medium of exchange. The reason gold became money and became so popular as money is because it was valuable 
uh, before it became money, and that was a very important reason for its popularity. By the way, when gold displaces wampum, that's not proof that uh, a currency can take place of a, uh, take uh, a, a, a over an established incumbent money, even though the incumbent money has a, a larger network. In fact, the gold traders were coming from big networks, and you had two networks coming together, right? Two economies that now become in con come into contact with each other. The larger economy's network now becomes more important than the small economy's network. So, final settlement. This is the most important point. I'm afraid I did read your book. I'm afraid you're quite wrong about final settlement. Zell, Venmo, the real times payment system that's just been set up these last two years by the New York Clearinghouse, Visa, MasterCard. These all involve instantaneous payment clearing and settlement. It's all done instantaneously. Whereas with, uh, with, with uh, Bitcoin, even if you tried to create a sub superstructure of other payments vehicles on top of it, at bottom, those six confirmations have to take place with all the sluggishness involved before payment could be final. It's the nature of the blockchain. So there is no way that you will ever have the speed of final settlement with Bitcoin or the low expense of accomplishing it than you can have today with all kinds of other monies, and in fact, you have with most of those monies. And everyone has got to think hard about what it's going to cost them, what it would cost them to switch to a Bitcoin standard in their day-to-day -day payments every time you pay for anything. You either wait a long time or you pay a lot or both. And stop thinking about whether the value of your Bitcoin is going to go up and think about it as a medium of exchange. Think about it from the average point of person's point of view and ask yourself whether this is likely to be so attractive that the average person will want to switch, even if it means going, having to not deal with a lot of traders in the short run. I don't think it's going to happen. Thank you. So, Professor Selgin in his reply said two things that I think um, uh, the, the contradiction exposes the problem with his argument. He said gold became popular as money. It, the fact that it was used for industry and that it was used for jewelry is what drove demand for it, and that's what allowed it to become popular as money, and that this had a stabilizing effect on the value of gold, and that Bitcoin without a stabilizing uh, demand, other kinds of demand, won't have that stabilizing effect. But then later on, he was uh, describing how the value, but, but I think this describes what, uh, and then when he talks about the difference between Bitcoin as a store of value and a medium of exchange, I think this exposes that there is no dichotomy there and there's no difference. In fact, the functions of medium of exchange and store of value are descriptive functions of the same thing. You can't be a medium of exchange without storing value because that's, you know, and you can't store value without using something as a medium of exchange. If you're storing value in something, you're going to exchange it at a future date. So it is used as a medium of exchange. So those two things are two functions that describe the same thing. And the key point is that it is precisely the fact that the growing, and that's the original point that is the contradiction. We said, you know, just because Bitcoin is worth $200 billion doesn't mean it's being used as money. That's exactly what it means. It means people are using it and they're holding on to more cash balances with it. And as the cash balances in Bitcoin grow, or as the value of jewelry grows, or as the value of held gold grows, then the possible opportunities for trade begin to emerge more and more. And so now, yes, within the US, Bitcoin is not used. But within the Bitcoin economy on the internet, Bitcoin is already bigger than most national currencies. And so we, it doesn't have to be bigger in any one particular country. It just needs to be growing all over the world. And as the demand continues to grow, as people continue to hold it more as a store of value, like this inevitably means that the opportunities for trading with others who also hold it as a store of value and would be willing to accept it or would be willing to use it as payment, these opportunities will likely increase more and more. And so right now, you know, $200 billion worth of Bitcoin distributed over, let's say, 1 million people around the world, that means that for the vast majority of us, 
it's highly unlikely that you're gonna to want to buy something from somebody who's willing to accept Bitcoin at this point. But when Bitcoin is worth $2 trillion, that equation changes. People will have to spend more of it because they will need to make payments. People will have to accept it as a payment, will want to accept it as payment. And so really it is the hardness, it is the use of the store of value that is going to build the cash balances that will then allow for its use as um, as a means of payment more and more extensively, just as was the case with gold. And yes, maybe the seashell network was smaller, but remember in the 1860s, silver was arguably more widely used as money than gold up until the early 1800s. China, India, and Germany, three major economies and much of the US economy were using silver as money and all over the world people were using silver as money. And yet silver was effectively demonetized by the 1870s because everybody switched to gold because gold was a harder money. That is ultimately what it comes down to. And I see nothing about the problems that uh, Professor Sanjil mentions in uh, Bitcoin that would prevent it from um, having this. And I think um, the notion, the the, the, the Professor Selgin says, you know, we are going to be losing the, um, if, if you're going to be, he's comparing it to the um, clearance that is instant, but that is clearance that is instant and final on the database of a government central bank. And so, you know, if this is not really a free market money, and that is the problem with it. It's a, it's, there is no possibility for having a true free market in an economy if the one half of every transaction is controlled and owned by the government. And that really is the problem with central banking, and that is the problem that Bitcoin solves by making the final layer of settlement, instead of it being one political institution controlled by governments, it makes it into a distributed protocol, distributed over thousands of nodes around the world, that cannot change the monetary policy and cannot, be, and cannot use political censorship against people who are using the technology. And that really is the real value proposition. And I think if you think of it just purely as a technological tool, it's clearly an example of you know, a bicycle versus a car. It's, it's, it's uh, you, current uh, monetary systems, they're using um, you know, a centralized system where you have to basically tell the government every time you're spending money, like you're a child telling their parents, uh, keep a tab on their um, you know, uh, allowance money. And that's an, in, an incredibly inferior system to one in which we don't have to report to governments, in which the final settlement does not require a government central bank to handle all of the clearance. And that's really, I think, value. Bitcoin brings. Thank you. Well, thank you, guys. And now we get to the Q&A portion of the evening. I, I want to start by uh, taking moderator's prerogative to, to basically clarify a question in my mind in terms of your exchange. I mean, we start with you, Safe. Uh, it seems as though, uh, and George can correct me in a moment if I got him wrong, uh, that, that George is basically saying that uh, that there is no way for Bitcoin transactions uh, to be cheap and speedy, uh, that, uh, that, that it's simply inconceivable. And so, you know, we take our credit card to the store, they swipe it in a moment. I mean, in the old days, they used to look it up in a book. They look up the numbers in a book. It took a while. I don't know if you're old enough to remember that, but now it takes no time, and the expense of the transaction is small, uh, and so it doesn't impede us. Uh, if are you, are you saying that George is mistaken to say that transactions such as you go to the store and you buy things, that those transactions can, in, in Bitcoin, can indeed be speedy and, and very cheap? Of course, they, they no, take, take the mic, yeah. They, you can make uh, these transactions based on Bitcoin and settle Bitcoin at the back end. So in other words, the Bitcoin transaction is better compared to the final settlement of physical gold between two central banks. So our choices before Bitcoin was invented was either we're going to have essentially one world government running one central bank for the world and deciding on everyone's, um, you know, who gets to spend how much and who can spend money anywhere, or we'd have a neutral political, a politically neutral international monetary system built on a neutral asset like gold 
And the problem with that, of course, is that you have to lug gold bars around the world and ship them, and that's expensive and insecure. Yeah. Bitcoin allows us to do that, but instead of lugging gold bars, we send a transaction that costs a few cents or a few dollars. But the point is the cost of a Bitcoin transaction could go up to $10,000, and it would still be a bargain compared to the final settlement of physical gold. That's what it really compares to, because well, you're not getting any final settlement from your credit card company or from your bank and from your central bank, because it's all fake money, effectively. It's all just a data entry at the central bank, and the central bank can take your money away at any moment. But Bitcoin offers you a hard asset that is nobody's liability, so it's more comparable to gold settlement. All right, but, uh, but again, I'm not clear that you've, that you face these. You, that you, you've gone into the other advantages of Bitcoin as you conceive of them, but, but again, you are claiming that I can take, I think I heard you say, I can take my, my big Bitcoin Visa card and, uh, and buy some toilet paper at, uh, at Walmart, and, and the transaction will be very speedy and very cheap. I can well, do that. You can, you can sort of do that already because there are some companies that issue credit cards that can, you can back them with your Bitcoin. Oh, if you can do that already, that's fine. Exactly. But, okay. I, and then, uh, but, and uh, do I understand you correctly, George, to say that that can't happen? That that the if yeah. the criteria. Oh, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. If the criteria for speed of payment in, is how quickly the payment is cleared and settled in the final payment medium, then all the verification that Bitcoin requires, all the confirmations, has to be have to be completed before the payment is truly complete. Yeah. And that's what costs a lot of money. It, uh, it costs money because it's a, all the computing power goes into it. So basically, every transaction with Bitcoin, you're, you're paying these fees because of all the computing power that goes into the verification, which takes time and a lot of money, and that's all going to be added to the cost of any kind of payments in a Bitcoin system. You can't evade that with credit cards. Uh, because ultimately the verification has to go through as the final layer of the final process of the payment. Whereas with ordinary money, with dollars, we now have ways to do instant payments on a number of different networks and they cost practically nothing and the clearing is done instantaneously. It's true that the final and the clearing and settlement are done instantaneously. It's true that not all payments, but many, and it's getting to the point where it'll be everything. The, it's true that the uh, final settlement often, not always, takes place on the books of central banks, and so you do have a trust issue. There's no question about it. I'm not denying that if the proposition where Bitcoin is the only thing that could take over from central banks and be abso absolutely non-government dependent, then the answer might be yes, but that isn't the proposition. The proposition is an empirical proposition. Is Bitcoin likely to actually take over from any government money? No, the proposition whether is whether it is suited. Suited to, okay. To not take Whether it's likely, we're not okay. discussing probability. Okay, fine. Whether it's well suited to take over from any established government money, which requires that ordinary people and large numbers of them who don't necessarily consider getting away from government money as their prime goal will nevertheless jump on this Bitcoin bandwagon despite its many disadvantages, including the fact that it's very costly to transact with. Okay, so, but, okay, so again, you were saying... Again, it's missing the point. Bitcoin can do more than about half a million transactions currently, daily. And that's nothing. That's less transactions than happens in Soho in Manhattan every day, probably. Well, so the notion that we're going to have all of your transactions on Bitcoin is a complete non-starter. There's only really... Um, anyways, well, the point is those transactions will, will be like the final settlement transaction. So instead of having a global monetary system which ships 100 international shipments of gold around the world, we can have an international monetary system that is built on a half a million Bitcoin settlement transactions well, around the world, okay, final and, settlement. Okay, and George, you're, you're, you, the, the, the difference between you, again, I'm just picturing the ordinary person going to Costco, Walmart, wherever I go, and, I, and I'm going to buy the equivalent of like 120 bucks worth of, of groceries and, and, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, paper, and, uh, and you're saying that the cost of that $120 transaction is going to be a huge piece of that 120 bucks, so that it's going to be prohibitively expensive. That's what you're saying, George? Yes? Yes, the smaller the... 
Well, 120 bucks. Yeah. The smaller the transaction, the, 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 the greater the can, ta- can tax. Can you go in with my 120 bucks? Uh, what, what do you think? It's going to be like 10%? It's going to be uh, that 120 it's, Well, it's very difficult to say because part of the problem is it fluctuates all the time depending on the computational this cost. Is, um, the, okay. This is, this is a, a constant very, okay. cost. This is a very big misconception because if your $100 payment to Walmart is not going to register on chain. Walmart is not going to wait for six confirmations for an hour before they give you your groceries. Just like, the, you know, if you're making an international payment, you, paying to somebody in China, they're not going to wait until the central banks settle the final payment before they ship you the stuff. So in fact, the, your grocery payment will be part of thousands of transactions that will be settled between your bank and Walmart's bank in the end of the day. And then the even if it was a $1,000 transaction fee for 100,000 transactions, probably it's going to be worth it. That's the key thing. If you think of the final settlement transaction as a settlement proxying for many, then yeah, you're not going to pay the transaction fee on $120 transaction bill. It's, 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 it's not accurate to continue to portray this problem. And it's, it's a okay. bunch of propaganda that has be plagued Bitcoin because of you know, people okay. who got emotionally hurt. That's that question. My final question, but my only other question to you, George. I had, so, I had somebody transfer some Bitcoin to me uh, just last week, just to test this. And in fact, uh, for a $10 transfer, what did it cost, Jeff? No. A dollar for a $10 transfer. That wasn't hypothetical. We well, just did it. Maybe it's scalable, George. But I, my question for you, George, is this uh, as well. Uh, let's imagine that we, uh, we have a recurrence of what occurred in the late 70s, even though worse. You know, the government, the, the treasury debt is ballooning. The government starts, print, our government starts printing money. We, we, we suddenly have what Greenspan anticipated could happen around uh, 2030. Uh, uh, inflation really heats up with the dollar. The euro is unstable. They're very wobbly. So, uh, so exactly what we fear central banks are going to do, which is inflate their currency, starts to happen. Does that change the ball game at all from your standpoint with respect to Bitcoin? If that were to happen. Well, if you have enough national currencies all going blotto at the same well, time. Dollar in the euro. <laughs> dollar in the euro bubble. Oh, uh, well, that still leaves, uh, let's see, we've got the franc, the gonna, pound, uh, a few go, other alternatives. You're going to flee the pound. Okay. All right. Uh, I, guess I that's think your that answer. those. I think that those would have a better chance than Bitcoin because they would be less costly. All right. But actually, I would think the Canadian dollar would be more convenient. You didn't mention that one. I didn't. The Canuck buck is going to rule. I guess that's your answer. Okay. Well, I guess I look forward to that. And you, do you have an answer for that safe? Uh, good luck on your Canadian dollars. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. Okay. Uh, and uh, guys, at any time, you have the opportunity to, to fire a question at the other. But maybe, as usually happens... Uh, just a, a, a little more serious answer. Just, you know, the... the, the path of government money only heads in one direction. Supply increases, value drops. And Bitcoin doesn't have that. So it's, if it's unsuited for you today, you know, let's check back 20 years later when Bitcoin supply has only gone up about 15% from where it is today, whereas you know, government monies have gone up 20x from where they are today on average. And then imagine the uh, overvaluation that will happen with Bitcoin compared to national currencies. And then think about, you know, how easy it will be for people to get over all of your objections to Bitcoin when you compare the devaluation that is happening to the alternatives. Okay, um, I, uh, we, uh, I think we have uh, questions from the audience because I think neither of you want to fire a question at the other at the moment. And so uh, please uh, ask your question as a question and tell us who you're addressing it to, if anybody. So for, for Dr. Amos, um, you know, one of, the, one of the questions was, you said the hard money always drives out the soft money. So gold drives out the seashells. And Professor Selgin tried to say that there's a difference between a store of value and a medium of exchange. And you said this was a misunderstanding on his part, that really in the end they're the, the same. The, the better store of value will be the medium of exchange, it will win. So my question is about uh, U.S. Re- residential real estate. It seems to me it's a very good store of value. It seems to me there's a lot of Chinese and Russian billionaires that agree with me and buy U.S. residential real estate as a store of value. It isn't a very good medium of exchange, in my opinion. So I, I'm going to go have sushi dinner with my wife. We're not going to pay with apartment REIT shares uh, when the check comes. We're going to pay with dollars. It's pretty tradable. It's probably less volatile than Bitcoin. Don't you think there's a? Do you really not believe there's a difference between? Do you always think the hard money drives out the good? The gold is harder money than the dollar, but we use dollars, not gold, for 
for paying for things. Are you, are you going to stick on this point? It seems to me Professor Seldon makes a really good case. I'm going to stick to it because actually the only reason we still use the dollar, the fact is that all the central banks in the world still continue to hold gold. If we are using dollars, they just dump all of their gold on the market. And that would be the end of it. But they don't because the only reason their money, you know, they don't trust each other's paper. They realize that the paper can be inflated to no end and therefore they only hold gold amongst themselves. That's the first point. To go back to your original question, functionally speaking, yes, when you, when you store value in your house, you are also in a sense functionally using it as a medium of exchange. But of course, a house is a crappy medium of exchange. Uh, sorry, excuse my language, but it's also a very bad uh, store of value because it's... Um, you know, it, obviously it's good because it's hard. It's harder to make more houses. It's harder to inflate the supply. But as you said, it's very hard to pay with you know a chunk of your house when you need it, and it's not liquid, and it takes a lot of time to sell. And you know, moving in and out of a house is very expensive and very costly. But the reason people are using real estate as a store of value, the people, the reason we have endless real estate bubbles, endless art bubbles, endless bubbles in everything, is because people are using all of these instruments like stocks and real estate and art as a store of value because we are legally banned from having a good money. We are not allowed to have a free market money because government restricts the free market for money through central bank monopoly, which means that as an individual, if you want to hold money, you need to hold money that is liquid across the world today. So you want to hold dollars or your national currency because you need to pay with it. And or if people outside the US, you know, they need to hold their national currency, they need to hold the dollar if they want to pay abroad. And if they would like to hold something that will hold value across time, they need to hold gold or real estate or so on. And so as a result, we need to use several things as a store of value and as a medium of exchange because we don't have the one good thing that would do this job. There was no real estate bubble happening under the gold standard because people weren't using their houses as a store of value. If you wanted to store value, you bought gold. If you wanted a house, you bought a house. Uh, any of you I response from you, George, or do you want to pass? What do you, uh, to the question, you want to comment, or you want well, to pass? There were some real estate bubbles under the gold standard. <laughs> when? Well, for one thing, in the 1920s was the most... That was not under the gold standard. It certainly was. No, the gold standard was suspended in 1914, and it was the suspension no. of the gold standard that led to the Depression they in 1929. On, they were back on gold. They were back I thought you said gold. it was a crappy gold standard. I thought you, you, that was your big point, George. Yeah, the whole cause of the crisis was they went off the gold standard to print money in the 1920s. Okay, we're, gonna, we're not going to resolve that one. Uh, uh, next question. I, I guess this is uh, primarily for Dr. Amus. Um, my understanding is that in order to transact a Bitcoin, like a, a single $10,000 Bitcoin, um, the... Um, thousands of participants have to solve some mathematical algorithm which requires a lot of uh, computation, giga hashes, whatever those are. Um, and this is getting very expensive. Um, it, is, it seems to me that the, uh, won't, won't the whole Bitcoin transaction procedure kind of strangle itself by just becoming so expensive that we can't afford to uh, do these computations anymore? Is the Soho Forum going to become so popular that we can't fit people into the place and then it no longer functions? If it becomes popular, you know, it's not going to fail because of too much demand. I think that's just a misunderstanding of how economics works. Uh, if people are demanding the transactions and the value of the transactions going up and Bitcoin continues to refuse to die, as we've been getting told by friend and foe for years, that that's what's going to happen because of transaction fees, perhaps it's time to revisit your priors and think about whether actually cheap transactions is the point of Bitcoin. In fact, it's... A, yeah, it's going to require more and more energy, and it's going to become more and more expensive, but it's going to proxy each more, you know, it's going to proxy for more and more transactions. So it'll actually be cheaper per transaction over time as more and more people continue to it's use it. It's scalable, yeah. Uh, comment from you, George, to the question, or do you want to pass and go to the next one? No, I'll pass and go to the next okay. one. Okay, next person, yeah. What do you think is going to be an impact of regulations? And why do you think that Bitcoin is, cannot be confiscated by the government when there were a number of cases when Bitcoins were confiscated? Mm -hmm. And when I, you're facing life sentence in prison, you probably might recall your private keys pretty fast. I guess it's a challenge to uh, SAFE, so I guess uh, uh, SAFE will have, will have you come in. I'm, I, I wouldn't say it can't be confiscated. I just say that it's much harder to confiscate than, say, gold, because gold requires physical settlement and clearance, which ends up because of the economies of scale involved, ends up with you know one central bank in every country. And so 
taking over gold was trivial in 1934 for the US government because they just banned banks from using gold and they took over the gold that was already in the banks. It's much harder with Bitcoin because instead of having one central bank, you're gonna have thousands of nodes. And so it's, you know, I'm not saying it will or it won't happen, we'll have to watch and see, but it has a much better chance of resisting capture than gold does. Comment, George? Oh, you wanna do? No, not really. I've tried to steer clear from the, the question of what governments might or might not do, because it's, of course, possible that governments could themselves uh, interfere with Bitcoin and make it less likely to succeed. But I don't want to uh, uh, appeal to that possibility in this debate because I don't think it's really the relevant question. Don't vote for George on that basis is what he's saying to you. Uh, so uh, uh, next question. Uh, yes, for Professor Selgin. Um, of the three monies discussed tonight, commodity money, which is gold, fiat money, which is issued by governments, and free market digital money, Bitcoin, uh, we know historically why the first two, or how the first two were adopted as money. We're watching Bitcoin struggle to be adopted as money, as you, your position seems to be. Um, can you articulate a path that any new money of any form would need to take in order to be adopted as money? And how can you be sure that the path Bitcoin is on is not taking the path of least resistance for some brand new money? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, the, the, uh, the fact is that once, you know, Menger, to talk a little bit about the theory here, if I may, Karl Menger, the Austrian founder of the Austrian school, developed the most famous theory of the origins of money, which explained how you could get commodity money from a situation where there was no generally used medium of exchange. It's a fascinating theory. Uh, that same theory also explains the network problem. That is, it points to the fact that once something is established as a generally accepted medium of exchange in any community, it's very difficult for something else to then get established. The horse race having been run, it's very difficult for anything. So I'm not actually, when I emphasize the, the network problem, I'm not really trying to say this is a prob that's a problem for Bitcoin. It's a problem for any upstart currency. And so they're all equally at a disadvantage in that regard. But then the point is, if such an upstart is going to try to get a leg up, and it can under the right circumstances where the incumbent currency is distrusted, depreciating, there are many things that could make it uh, make tempt people to take the risk of joining a smaller network and taking their chances with it. But then it's a question of how uh, relatively attractive the upstart is compared to the incumbent. And it has to be fairly attractive in a lot of dimensions. And that's where I think Bitcoin suffers, because in some crucial respects, it has real disadvantages compared to other potential alternatives, including gold, by the way, which hasn't come up enough in this context. I think people would be more likely to use gold in an emergency, let's say the, the euro and the dollar and the Canadian dollar, et cetera, are all going kerplop, that gold might have a better chance of taking off than Bitcoin because despite its clear transactions cost of moving it around, between it and claims to it, it could have advantages compared to Bit that Bitcoin lacks. You, you had mentioned cryptocurrency, George. Is there a cryptocurrency that you could like or do like aside from Bitcoin? Uh, I won't mention particular names. Uh, there are, it, it's so experimental at this point, but there are some others that I think have advantages. I will say that the second most popular, Ethereum, has some of the same disadvantages as Bitcoin as far as transaction costs. I think that it has uh, uh, roughly, can handle roughly twice as many transactions. That's not a big difference. So it also has that, that problem of high, of. Uh, of a scalability uh, a disadvantage, but some of the others may be better on, on, on those at that and other grounds. 
The right. thing is that a distributed network is going to inevitably be less efficient than a centralized network. If you're going to have one computer with a backup record the transaction, it's much easier. So on my laptop, there's software that I could download that would allow me to run 15,000 transactions per second. You know, I could run a payment network on my laptop and do 15,000 transactions per second. It's trivial. The problem is my laptop is not very reliable. And so you're not going to build an international monetary system on my laptop. However, 10,000 laptops connected to one another is going to be very slow and very kludgy and very inefficient, but it's reliable as, and it's more reliable than anything else. It's really reliable. And so the, the notion that we are going to continue to judge cryptocurrencies by their speed is completely, I think, misplaced. It's, not, it's never going to be able to scale to a scale that allows us to have mass consumer payments. It's out of the question. And you know, we've had a few experiments with some of the altcoins. They forked Bitcoin's code and they made the Bitcoin with a bigger block size. And now nobody uses it and the coins are dying a painful, slow death. And it's just proof that this thing is not going to be used for mass consumer payments. It's never going to work. Now I have to ask my question. Okay which is how can something be the main medium of exchange of any economy and not be used for mass consumer payments? These are the same thing. It's really hard that, that you're missing the distinction between something being used as a medium of exchange and something being used as a means of payment. So in, in order to simplify this, if I make a payment to Professor Selgin right now with PayPal, what is the medium of exchange that we used? The dollars, yes, not PayPal. PayPal is the method of payment. And the Bcash people have made this such a big misunderstanding with all of the propaganda that they've done that people have missed the distinction. When you're making a payment with PayPal, you're using PayPal as the method of payment, but the medium of exchange is a dollar. And no actual physical dollars were harmed in the making of that payment. <laughs> So at the end of the week or the month, my bank and your bank will settle with one another and you know, there might actually be physical gold moving around between, uh, physical uh, money moving around between the banks and the central banks. But we have to understand the distinction between the settlement layer and the consumer layer. And so continuing to compare Bitcoin to the consumer layer misses the point because there's no way Bitcoin will ever handle 1% of the transactions that Visa can handle. Visa is just always going to be much faster than Bitcoin, but that's fine. It's a completely different engineering problem. And so Visa, PayPal, all of those things can, are, are completely orthogonal to Bitcoin. Um, dollar, gold, and Bitcoin, that's Bitcoin's competition. Visa, PayPal, and so on, they compete with the Lightning Network as settlement, as payment solutions. So, so, so they can be Visa, PayPal, Bitcoin, is what you're saying. Okay, yeah, uh, next question. Uh, thank you both for, this is fantastic. Check out Saif's book, it's fantastic. Um, um, to either of you, um, there's talk about clearance settlement. If I were to take my dollars out of my bank account and put those in my safe in my house, um, I now have those, I mean, those, those are settled and cleared, right? In other words, I own those. Is that right? I mean, could you guys perhaps speak to this idea of final settlement and clearance? Because in my mind, uh, there is no such thing as final settlement with a fiat currency because at any point in time, uh, take the Indian $20, take the 1933 gold uh, confiscation. I mean, there is no such thing as final settlement. So the time to settle in a US dollar is, I don't think it ever occurs. And so in that regard, I think Bitcoin settles at an exceedingly faster rate, and perhaps you could speak to that. Thanks. Um, yeah, do, you want, do you want to comment? Yeah, uh, sure. I agree. Uh, you agree. Uh, Safe agrees with what you just said. Uh, uh, do you agree too, George? No, I don't agree. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, there really is such a thing as final settlement. It's, I mean, it's two different things here. One is whether the government can grab your stuff. That's one issue. The other is whether it's such a thing as final settlement in a dollar fiat system. And there is. And it occurs when the, when the, actual, uh, the when actual ownership of base dollars, which are either cash or, or credit balance on the, uh, in the reserve account at the Federal Reserve Bank 
has uh, made its way to the bank that uh, handled the transaction, then it's finished. When no one knows, when no one owes anything anymore, then it's final. That's, that's a great way of putting it. When nobody owes anybody anything anymore, then the transaction has settled. But that's not the case with your PayPal payment. It takes much longer for it to settle. And so that's why, that's what Bitcoin is up against. It's up against the banks settling with one another and the central banks settling with one another. And as, as he mentioned, the effective real settlement time in fiat is infinite because you never know 10 years later you can, they can come and take your money. It, it, they don't have to come and take your money. Your money is theirs. You just have, you know, they let you take it out every now and then occasionally, but it's effectively government money and government can confiscate it at all times. So Bitcoin is a massive improvement in that regard because it allows us the access to base money to be far more widely distributed and decentralized and available for more people. Next question. Hi, thank you both. Um, professor, you said in your opening, that because centralized exchanges have been hacked, somehow that makes Bitcoin the network uh, vulnerable to hack, considering Bitcoin the network has an uptime of 99.6%. I'm just a little confused how the two are related. What was the, what was the last part of what you said? Considering you, you said that because the centralized, ex in, in your opening statement, yeah. you said the centralized exchanges have been hacked, which is true. I think we're all aware of many, uh, you know, ha hackings that have happened. Somehow that makes Bitcoin the network vulnerable to hack as well. But my question is, considering that Bitcoin the network has an uptime of 99%, I'm just a little bit confused how one, how, how, they're, how they're equitable. Well, I never said that the Bitcoin network was vulnerable. I only said that the exchanges were vulnerable, but that's where a lot of people keep, keep their money much of the time. So the, the question is whether the storage facilities are vulnerable uh, compared to the storage facilities for established monies like the dollar, which would be yeah. banks. Yeah. And that was the comparison I made. That's different from network vulnerability, and I, I readily concede that. Uh, yeah. uh, final, uh, this, unfortunately, is going to have to be the final question of the evening. I'll be very quick then. Um, Say, if I saw you speak about two years ago and I wrote at the time that you gave the most plausible case for the mass adoption of Bitcoin that I've ever heard, and I agree that it continues to be. I also wrote at the time um, that you characterized it as inevitable. I didn't hear that tonight, and I'm wondering whether I misunderstood at the time or whether you've lowered the probability in your mind of it happening. I've gotten older and I've got more gray hair and I've learned to be less certain about things in life. <laughs> Do the kids who acted on your advice think that's funny? <laughs> All right, the way, yeah, yeah, the resolution is just has to do with suitability, and neither uh, side is talking about inevitability. Uh, George is saying noth nothing's inevitable with either of these guys. Uh, so we've clarified that suitability, not inevitability, is the resolution. I uh, will give it one, fi one final question. Yeah. So my question is, do you think that the portion of yeah. Bitcoin that is used as a speculative asset is significant, and how would it affect it becoming a medium of exchange yeah. Um, safe, yeah. I think all Bitcoins are used as speculative assets, and that's fine. Uh, money is a speculative asset, and you know, speculation gets a bad rep because you know, uh, it's always blamed by governments. You know, whenever inflation happens, it's always because of the speculators and the, the evil foreigners or whatever. But really, speculation is what you do every moment of your life. You're speculating on economic activities, and you're making... Um, decisions on it and, and holding money is a speculative act because the only reason as Mises explains the only reason people hold money is because of uncertainty life is uncertain and therefore you have to hold money because you don't know what you're going to be doing or what you need to spend in the future so in that sense you know Bitcoin being speculative me holding Bitcoin speculatively is no different than holding dollars or anything else speculatively you hold it so that you can exchange it in the future for something else and you hope that you can get a lot for it it's no different when you do it with dollars and Bitcoin it's just Bitcoin is, um, you know, it's going through the process of monetization at a, a very fast rate. So at this point, Bitcoin can be better thought of, I think, as sort of like a seed investment in a startup that is planning to replace all of the world's central bank. And you, this startup is a sort of a self-organizing, spontaneous startup um, that, you know, instead of shares, it has the own Bitcoin coins. And instead of having a management that just has a bunch of algorithm that will take the value, that, that will issue new coins and provide it to the people who secure the network. And you know, it's just this 
random, uh, not random, this spontaneously emergent organization that's going to eat all the central banks of the world. And if you buy Bitcoin right now, effectively you're feeding that monster and you're speculating on the monster growing further. So it is, it is more of a speculative asset than just money right now, but that's fine. That's how we're going to have to eat central banks. George, you want to respond with your, as part of your summation? Yeah. Take, take, please take this to the part. We do that, okay, five minutes of summation, or do you, do you insist on an answer? Oh. Take it to the podium with your five minutes of summation. Is that right? All right. All right, it's good. Okay. <laughs> I was going to say very briefly that uh, all monies are speculative, uh, uh, as, as Safe said, uh, but some of them are more risky than others. <laughs> and that, I say, is the difference between Bitcoin and a lot of established monies. But it's by way of summary, I guess all I really want to uh, insist upon is the fact that when, when ordinary people, when ordinary people, which excludes many of you, uh, <laughs> When, when, when ordinary people think, what should I, what, 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 what kind of money do I want to equip myself with? What, what should I use as a medium of exchange? The answer again, first of all, is what's everybody else using? What does a store down the street take? What, uh, what do my workers want to get paid in? These are the the mundane issues that are asked, and they speak of the importance of established network size. But beyond that, they ask, how risky is this stuff going to be to have on hand all the time? Do I risk losing a large percent of the value just while I'm waiting to do my shopping? Is it going to fluctuate a lot? Do I have to make all kinds of elaborate plans to protect myself? Finally, they're going to ask, every time I shop with this, how long is it going to take for my payment to be complete? And what's it going to cost me? Are they going to, is there going to be a, 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 nar a substantial fee extracted from every payment to cover the costs of verification, etc.? Do I have to pay extra if I want it done quickly, if I want to assure the payee that the money is going to be there on time? These are the questions people ask. And if, they're an and if the answer is that uh, an established currency is more attractive on many of these scores than an upstart, the upstart has no chance. If the answer is that the established currency isn't all that attractive, but there are other currencies with large networks that might be used instead, they are going to have a better chance than that new currency. And for all these reasons, Bitcoin's odds, its suitability, if you prefer, since we're talking about that, its suitability to take over as the main currency of any country is very, very poor. I hope the private marketplace will come up with new alternatives, potentially new cryptocurrencies, that beat Bitcoin in many of these respects and make for a better alternative to established fiat monies. But if we stop now, if we say Bitcoin or bust, I think it's going to be bust. Thank you. I mean, ultimately, I think I will sum up and say that, um, you know, the, the, the Freudian slip Professor Selden said about, you know, the odds, it's still thinking of it in terms of probability. And I think, you know, he hasn't provided anything in terms of the actual suitability that could sway somebody to change their mind on this. I think we went over the points and I don't think, you know, the cost of transacting is not an issue because it's not, you're not going to be paying that transaction fee. That transaction fee is going to be divided over many thousands of transactions. The volatility is purely a function of the size, and I think the same is in terms of the liquidity available and what is the neighboring uh, grocery store using. I see these as purely um, functions of Bitcoin's nascence, Bitcoin's youth. And I would have imagined six years ago, for instance, if somebody had told me, yeah, this thing is never going to take, oh, take over, I think it might have made more of um, a compelling case because at that point, you know, Bitcoin was worth a few hundred million dollars or whatever. But now we've seen it grow so much and we've seen how it has been able to handle that growth. We've seen how um, you know, sec it, security continues to work even as it grows. And you know, th there's nothing to suggest that it would stop functioning as it grows. And then there is, that means that basically there's, that there's no compelling reason why it wouldn't be suitable. And the fact is, 
Professor Selgin goes back to talking about people's choices in this and whether people will choose it or not, but that again is irrelevant to the suitability. And ultimately, the choice of money is not a democracy. You know, we don't get together and decide we want to use uh, you know, silver as money or gold as money or seashells as money. It's cold, hard economic reality that imposes it. Use a store of value that is easy to inflate and you will not have any value left. So it's not even about your choice, because if, if you choose badly, you just don't have any more money left, and then only the people who chose wisely have money left. And that's how hard money works. That's how gold drove out all the many other pretenders, and the people who had that money, you know, their vote about whether they like gold's color, or whether they prefer silver's color, or whether they prefer the network effect of their local seashells, doesn't matter anymore. Gold won because they stored their wealth in an easy money and that easy money was inflated. And Professor Selgin is, I think, um, is missing the fact that this is what is happening all over the world, you know, with negative interest rates and with the inflation around the world. It's just becoming harder and harder for people to be able to store value in their money, in their national currencies. And so Bitcoin is, um, is essentially winning by default right now because nothing else is even trying to be a store of value because the world is full of Keynesians who think that store of value is a bad thing and that, you know, people shouldn't have a store of value because, you know, the government knows what they should invest in or whatever. So, in a sense, Bitcoin is already winning in this regard. It is already growing, and I don't see anything compelling to suggest it. And I think the, 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 the suggestion that, you know, hopefully other cryptocurrencies come about is, uh, you know, it, it's been used to promote many thousands of cryptocurrencies, but none of them has introduced any thing at all that Bitcoin cannot do. There isn't a single currency other than Bitcoin that has done anything that Bitcoin can't do yet. And the, you know, we hear so many promises and so many ideas. But I think the key point is this, as Professor Selgin is one of the foremost scholars who's written on money being free and on the free market and money, I think the point is, in terms of suitability, I think it's clear that it is suitable. It's already more suitable than most national currencies because it's already an economy much larger than most national currencies. And the reality is, this is it. This is the only chance we have of a free market money. We can argue theoretically, in, like you do in some of your papers, about poss possible better models for Bitcoin's uh, monetary policy. Maybe days are indeed better. Maybe, you know, having a money that supply that grows at 2% is better. I don't think it is, but, you know, even conceding that it is doesn't really matter at this point because that money is not going to come about. We're not going to have a central bank implement an algorithmic rule. It can't be implemented. It can always be overrun. We're not going to be able to develop something that is completely trustless anymore. Bitcoin was really a truly one-off experiment that can't really easily be repeated. And it doesn't need to be. All of the people that are just constantly finding problems with Bitcoin need to just come to peace with it. This is your only alternative to central banks. Deal with it. <laughs> well, thank you uh, guys for a very spirited debate. Uh, very lively and done. Uh, you both behaved like ultimate gentlemen. So you both won tonight in that sense, a very important sense. Uh, we now want to open the final vote, which you've done, Jane. Open the final vote. Again, uh, the resolution is Bitcoin is poorly suited to the purpose of becoming any nation's main medium of exchange. Both sides were addressing suitability. That word suitability, uh, very important. Uh, and so, uh, where do we stand? Uh, okay, we've got the final vote. Well, Okay, uh, poorly suited. Uh, it is poorly suited to be a main medium of exchange. Uh, the pre-vote was 30, uh, nearly 35% on that. That was in favor of the resolution. Uh, it gained a little over seven points to 41%. So that's the number to beat. George gained seven points. Uh, uh, on the other hand, the no vote went from 28% to 50%, so SAFE picked up 22 percentage points, SAFE gets the token.